everybody. Um, my name is Peter Avila. I'm with Harmony. I'm your host today for this Fireside Chat. Today we are speaking with Calvin Chu from Impossible Hello. Finance. Hey, Calvin. Hey, super great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. We're super excited to talk to you, learn about you, and also about Impossible Finance and what you're up to. Um, first of all, I, I I just want to let the audience know. So I've known Calvin for a while, um, and I kind of want to reminisce a little bit. The first time we met was in ETH. Was that San Francisco Blockchain Week? Okay. It it's like four or five years ago. It was a while ago. I think it was uh, almost... Uh... Almost uh, exactly four years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember. So we were having, uh, I was with another company at the time. And we were having a, um, like an off San Francisco blockchain event. Uh, it was another fireside chat actually with, um, yes. who was it? Uh, uh, Taylor from uh, my oh, yeah, yeah. Taylor from my crypto. Exactly. And, uh, and her baby in attendance as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, that was a really interesting fireside chat because not a ton of people came, but then when we aired the video later, it got tons of views because of, I think it was like the first time like uh, a female founder in crypto was interviewed and she had her baby on stage, which was like a big deal. And I wish we kind of see more of that. You know, yeah, that was, that was pretty great. cool. Exactly. So anyway, so it's really great to talk to you again um, and to, to catch up with you. Well, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, we'd love to learn about kind of like, you know, your history, how you got into crypto and, um, and then we'll, let's get into kind of impossible, uh, what, what impossible yeah. finance is all about. Yeah. So when I first met Pete, I was, uh, yes, yeah, I think I was still in uh, school. I had just uh, started, you know, getting deeper into the, the crypto space. And, uh, actually, uh, Pete and I are both from, uh, the university of Chicago. Uh, so, uh, go, go Maroons, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think, uh, our paths were very, very different going into, uh, crypto. I ended up going straight into, uh, uh, Binance right after undergrad. Uh, and I think when I met Pete, uh, Pete was also a volunteer at the ETH SF hackathon, uh, doing the dirty work on the overnight shift, literally picking up trash for all <laughs> the coders that had stinky breath and, you know, taking off their socks and everything. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, that's where I first met Pete that, uh, we were both at this event, uh, uh, around the SF blockchain week, uh, kind of, uh, stretch and that, uh, you know, after this uh, event, the, the fireside chat that you mentioned, uh, the hackathon was around that time as well. And so you were learning a lot about all these other things that were being built in the EVM compatible world. And obviously, uh, you know, at that point in time, the proliferation of DeFi and DApps hadn't really happened just yet, but that uh, there's clearly a lot of demand for people building cool stuff. And that was part of what I was uh, kind of working on at Binance that, uh, you know, some of my experience was kind of building up the listing framework, as well as doing a lot of the due diligence for various projects um, that, uh, you know, have, you know, built lots of very interesting things across the space. And so, you know, it was always a, an incredible hunt uh, to try and find as many different, you know, products out there that were offering, uh, you know, new solutions for, for users. And we were really, really lucky to be able to be on the forefront of, you know, seeing a lot of these uh, projects grow. Uh, of course, Harmony was one of the earliest finance launch pads that we had the pleasure of being able to do back in 20, uh, 2019, I believe. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously the, the bet on trying to uh, push proof of stake as well as, uh, you know, Ethereum scaling solutions and, and other uh, Ethereum alternatives uh, has been, you know, very lucrative across 2020 and 2021. Uh, but that at, at Binance, what we were really just focused on was just trying to bring a level of quality control that maybe wasn't uh, proliferating across many of the other uh, centralized exchanges. Uh, it's, I think, really interesting to see that today in DeFi and a lot of these different uh, token ecosystems, there's a lot more self-governance and, and policy making amongst the uh, kind of social standards of the participants in these different DeFi groups, such that there's even more shaming when small things pop up in, in a community in the grand scheme of things, such as, say, Sushi's Phantom Troop and all of these VCs coming in to invest. 
that you have a lot more publicity and transparency or, or maybe uh, accountability because of the transparency in a lot of the DeFi that has happened. And unfortunately, that's something that's maybe not in every single centralized uh, ecosystem in the world, uh, uh, to put it lightly. And unfortunately, that's something that you know was the backdrop of the 2017 ICO mania and all these different exchanges. And uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of this kind of uh, you know shift in in what people expect out of an exchange, uh, whether it be trying to do some quality control for uh, projects listed or uh, offered via uh, IEOs. Uh, you know the reason why people recognize that phrase Launchpad or IEO is a little bit because of you know, the incredible project teams that we got to be able to work with like Harmony through our, you know, Binance Launchpad ecosystem. So uh, that was what uh, took most of my last uh, kind of three years and have been, uh, you know, really enjoying my time uh, in, in crypto. I can't really imagine doing anything else uh, now. And so, uh, you know, post uh, Binance, I am now fully focused on uh, helping build uh, Impossible Finance. Um, so impossible is uh, kind of taking the the kind of torch over from uh, some of these uh, kind of centralized experiences that we've had to hopefully bring some of the best of both worlds of both the centralized uh, quality control maybe uh, or or deal vetting that that you've come to expect from some of these top tier platforms, as well as some of the openness, uh, you know, collaboration and. Uh, integration po- opportunities within the DeFi world. And so I'm sure, you know, Pete will, will ask me more questions about this later in this uh, fireside chat as well. But, you know, obviously our plans to continue scaling to as many different chains as possible and cover as many of these different uh, token ecosystems. I think uh, I'll, I'll give a small tidbit here in that uh, the way that our mental model for this type of expansion is we want to be the ice cream truck of DeFi. Uh, users exist in all these different neighborhoods and all these different chains. It's our job to go to where they are. Uh, mm-hmm. If it's a hot summer day of uh, DeFi summer, then there better be a ice cream truck that comes to your door, not you walk all the way miles and miles to find, you know, a gas environment that 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 m- makes sense for you, right? Um, so whatever we can do to lower that distance to ice cream truck, we can. Uh, that's what we're going to do as impossible. No, that sounds really great. You so you you shared a bunch of concepts in there that some of them might be new to some of our um, audience. So we'd love I'd love to learn more about um, first of all Launchpad, like just the concept of a Launchpad. I and uh, and 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 I love that you you spent you know the majority of your time at Binance uh, working with you know a really a great pipeline of projects, and so your experience there with their Launchpad. Um, you know, I, I think has carried over into this new venture that you've launched, but yeah, tell us, but what is a launch pad? And, um, and I love the concept of an ice cream truck. And I, I want to hear more about how, uh, more about impossible and how impossible is making that happen, um, with, with all the, 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 the chains that, um, it's supporting. Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, at, at Binance, we had the pleasure of being able to see an incredible amount of on-chain data as well, uh, especially uh, in throughout 2019 and 2020. My main focus at Binance was leading the Binance staking product. And so we got to see a lot of incredible on-chain data of how many real users each of these different chains had, right? Hmm. A lot of people talk big, uh, you know, on Twitter or other places, but we were the ones that were able to see like, hey, how many real users are depositing on a day-to-day basis, uh, you know, actually using these chains, right? At that point in time, so many projects were just ERC-20s. They didn't, you know, they promised a mainnet two years later, and then they still didn't have one, right? Um, and so when we started integrating these different chains and showcasing, hey, you know, there's actually, look, a lot of people using each of these different chains. I think Harmony was like one of the first chains to get to like a hundred decentralized validators. You know, very interesting kind of stats that honestly, maybe the public never got to see. That was something that we were always very uh, kind of focused on trying to be a part of on, on the forefront so that then we would have the best information to be able to act on. And that's something that I think fundamentally is really important for the end user. Um, obviously, a lot of the folks today here don't really 
um, you know, maybe have a, maybe, maybe you have a lot of experience in, in traditional finance or other places where, uh, you know, you rely on like a Bloomberg terminal or you have your go-to like sources of, of data and information. Uh, unfortunately, blockchain is not always like that. I think DeFi is a, a very interesting case in that a lot of the smart contract code is open source and all the interactions are publicly available on the blockchain, but there's still a level of processing that's needed, uh, whether it be via doing analytics or, uh, covalent or some of these other data providers lately that, you know, uh, you know, it's still not super easy for someone that doesn't know how to write any code or has never really interacted with this space to get, uh, get deeper into the analysis of what's going on. And, and so obviously leaving Binance, having, you know, led multiple projects, uh, to, you know, somewhere around a 200 to 400 X return, uh, for, for Binance and its, uh, you know, public sale participants, uh, for these projects. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of people I think expected maybe me to go down a traditional fund route or do something uh, on my own, uh, that could, you know, raise some capital and then do a lot more on the strategic investment side, uh, privately. But I think part of the kind of value add and, and the goal of a lot of these decentralized ecosystems is that, you need to tap into the audience and the potential user base of each of these different chains. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, by doing something in private, you're inherently doing something that scales less than something in public. Um, and, yeah. and that's the core tenant that uh, Binance Launchpad really tapped into as a centralized exchange launch platform that, that we were issuing, uh, helping these project teams issue a token to a retail audience that, maybe private uh, previously without the help of this kind of framework or guidance uh, would not be able to reach as many, uh, you know, active users. I think, um, you know, Binance Smart Chain is a great example of this in that it's not incredible as a technological innovation, but it's very interesting from an executional standpoint of, you know, bringing on many, many users who had never had a seed phrase or a meta mask before uh, to actually go and participate in using uh, you know, DeFi protocols and, and products. So, you know, off the record, I don't, I don't know if this is a, you know, a guaranteed correct uh, data point. So I, I put a little asterisk next, next to it, but uh, around the time that BSC, uh, you know, caught a little bit of popularity, uh, MetaMask downloads doubled. So, uh, you know, in a span of maybe a few weeks, uh, the amount of users that touch DeFi and, and MetaMask uh, you know, doubled what was hard work from when Vitalik first launched, uh, you know, Ethereum, in, you know, what, five years ago. So, so anything that does what other people took five months or five years to do in a few weeks, I think usually you want to pay attention to what's, what's happening there. And I think really the, the recipe or success behind a lot of BSC was just tapping into the existing audience of, engaged crypto uh, uh, believers that had not converted yet to crypto users, mm -hmm. that they might trade tokens, they might talk about tokens, they might talk about assets and ecosystems, but they didn't actually get their hands dirty themselves. And that's why part of the reason uh, why we're so excited about DeFi as a whole and the proliferation of all of these different uh, chains and product ecosystems, because it finally gave something where people can play. And when you give people a sandbox to play in, they will figure out the, all of the games and the rules that they want to build. Uh, up till then, I think a lot of people, they understood maybe the international remittances use cases or, or, or you know, online digital payments use cases of, of crypto. But there are always lots of centralized products that, you know, you could already use, whether it's your local PayPal or pay, uh, Venmo, things like this, right? Um, that, that you already have in a centralized service format. Um, but that in, in DeFi, now there are the things that are maybe the next uh, kind of dimension. If, if uh, we think of simple transactions as just a 2D kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, DeFi has opened it up into all of these different types of transactions that you could possibly do uh, in a digital world. And I think that has been you know, the, the key to get so many different folks into this space uh, you know, and I think that it's really important for everyone to note that uh, it's never too late. Uh, you know, I think I felt like when I joined uh, Binance that, man, I'm like coming straight out of college with, you know, student loans, like everyone else that's been holding Bitcoin for so many years and invested their, 
you know, traditional finance or tech salaries into crypto, like they've got such a huge head start. Um, and I think the thing that, you know, I, I didn't have any fancy proprietary information per se, right? I was really just hustling on Twitter, right? Or, or checking all of these uh, Telegram groups, these Discord groups, just to find out about the next uh, kind of product. And I think keeping an open mind is really important. And I think that's, uh, you know, something that this NFT uh, wave of late, I think really teaches one key thing. It's not about uh, what you know, it's what you're willing to try to learn about. I think a lot of people discount, they see something like NFTs and they say, that's just the game. I'm not going to learn it. The I think the big brain move on this kind of IQ curve is people realize that games are what humans love to spend time on, uh, or art is what lots of uh, folks in the uh, offline rich world uh, like to invest in. Yeah. So from a behavioral psychology perspective, it doesn't actually sound too crazy to believe that people are willing to pay, you know, ungodly amounts of, of money for a JPEG when <laughs> people spend, uh, you know, ungodly amounts of money for not JPEGs as well. Right. A piece of canvas. Um, exactly. Right. And yeah. so, you know, I think a lot of it is that uh, the thing I noticed was that when I first, uh, you know, got deeper into some of these different NFT discords and other stuff, like, again, these are things that anybody with this link could have just went to check the discord. If you went in maybe December of last year into the CryptoPunks discord, you would have noticed that maybe four of the founding uh, team members of Compound and uh, uh, other leading DeFi protocols, uh, they were admins or moderators or at least elevated uh, mm. you know, highlighted names in this discord channel that that was alpha that was sitting there for everybody. That's a great signal. And, and that when you dug one level deeper, you go and click on that guy's name. You maybe know that that's the CEO of compound or the head researcher at gauntlet, you know, whatever it may be, uh, you go and click and then you search their name on, uh, ENS domains or, or check their, their wallets. And you can see lo and behold, they have seven crypto punks. And at that point in time, it was, you know, six ETH at the time. And so maybe you would say, oh, wow, one ETH, $1,000, maybe, uh, you know, this guy has seven of them at a six ETH valuation. This really smart person that has lots of money in DeFi has invested 40 some thousand dollars into JPEGs. That was a data point that everyone had the opportunity to be able to take home and decide whether or not they want to, treat it as a fad or do something about it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I actually say that a lot of the uh, kind of openness of, of DeFi and, and, and a lot of these different uh, ecosystems actually means that it's actually really hard to hide. You can't have a position or a uh, kind of opinion without really needing to think through it because people might ridicule you for mm -hmm. anything that you do on the internet now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a spotlight. And it's also something that means that if somebody associates their real, uh, you know, uh, identity with something, and, and this was, I'm sure, uh, a point of discussion for many DeFi protocols as people are building out stuff, whether or not to be anonymous, you know, we saw the rise of many anonymous projects over the last kind of year or two. Um, but that, you know, it's also something where people, uh, put a lot of weight into something when someone puts a name behind it. And that's mm -hmm. just kind of how humans are uh, wired from, from the start. Like you can't just say DeFi summer uh, removes yeah. uh, the need for, for human identities, right? I, I love my metaverses. I love my, you know, uh, virtual uh, kind of identity. But I also think that it means a lot to say when I leave Binance and I'm focused on doing something that is a decentralized launch pad so that everyone can participate. Mm -hmm. I think that says a lot as well. And I think that's I exactly agree. what we want to be able to build uh, as we try to, you know, navigate this, uh, you know, very decentralized uh, world with maybe some of the more uh, comfortable touch points that the mm -hmm. traditional centralized world is is kind of used to. So you 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 set a lot of concepts there, and I want to kind of double click on a couple of them. First of all, the the idea that a launch pad can be a really great onboarding vehicle for brand new users. I mean, doubling MetaMask users, or you know, allegedly, you know, with Binance Smart Chain launch, you know, MetaMask downloads, you know, two x, which is really amazing. Um, you know, which brings us back to Impossible Finance as a launch pad. Like, tell us more about Impossible. 
And like, what are some of the goals and why, why is it even called impossible? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the credit really goes to Aave, uh, one of the kind of decentralized uh, finance platforms for lending and borrowing. Uh, and I think uh, I was really lucky in that at Binance, we weren't always right, but we had the opportunity to talk with a lot of smart people building cool things. And so uh, I remember back in 2018, uh, Ave used to be called EFLEND, and we almost delisted. I remember. Yeah. Uh, at that point in time, their user base was a P2P protocol, or their product was a P2P protocol. And so the lending really didn't have much liquidity, and very few folks were using it on chain. ETH gas fees were not super small, and they only really listed a few assets, not uh, you know, all of these major assets that Aave now supports. And so, uh, you know, we had a sit down conversation with them and said, Hey, you know, we got to pick up these user numbers or else we might have to delist. Mm -hmm. And Stani from Aave was like, you know, I think I have an idea. I think, you know, maybe we can build a really good, you know, a uh, collateralized lending pool. I, I know compound has one, but we're going to try and do some things with some different stuff. And we said, okay, we'll give you guys a shot. We won't delist now. We'll see how things go. Right. And then uh, it just so happens that that thing becomes Aave, right? Um, but that one of the things that fueled a lot of Aave's uh, rise was that for a large part of DeFi summer, because of the amount of borrowing demand in all these different lending pools and, and, and yield farms, as well as uh, the rise of flash loans as a thing that they didn't you know, necessarily pioneer, but they definitely, uh, they didn't maybe invent, but they definitely pioneered. Um, and, and raised a lot of attention for flash loans in this entire space. The flash loans, uh, for, for the, those of you new to the audience, they are uh, borrowing money to do maybe arbitrages or other things uh, and returning them within the same block on a blockchain, right? So that means essentially a zero time duration loan. Uh, and so they charge usually some sort of fee. And as long as that fee is greater than zero, it's essentially an infinite interest APY for zero blocks or zero time. Um, so it's a very interesting concept to be able to allow users to borrow from different pools and return it. It's like when you say uh, to your neighbor, hey, can I borrow a pen? I'll give it back to you real quick. And you're like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, technically this pen has some value to it, but I'm not going to charge you for the, you know, milliseconds that you use to go write a signature and then hand me back this pen, right? And, and at scale, when you can do that with millions of dollars, that's a lot of fees that you can collect. Uh, for it on behalf of a, a asset pool or for lenders inside a, you know, a digital bank or some sort of smart contract, right? Um, and so Aave at that point in time had what we would call impossible rates that it always had higher lending rates than borrow rates. So if you lent a dollar to Aave, you might get 10% APY. And if you try to borrow uh, uh, let's say a stable coin like USDC from Aave, you might only have to pay 8%. And that's something that is physically impossible for any retail bank in the world to do. A retail bank cannot go and give credit card loans to, you know, maybe delinquent, uh, uh, you know, uh, loan takers uh, at say 5% and then give you 10% in corporate bonds or other random stuff to let the retail user invest in, right? And, and that's something that from a business model does, like it, it kind of makes sense, and, but that in, in the DeFi world, because of the permissionless autonomous nature of how all of these different uh, smart contracts work, your money works a lot harder for you than in the traditional world. Why? Mm -hmm. Because these smart contracts work 24 seven. It's like investing in a vending machine versus investing in a, a convenience store that op only opens from uh, what, 9 a.m. to 3 a.m. like that trading right. went on, on Wall Street. So if you think about it, right? Uh, the amount of activity that can happen in a 24 seven world, that's 168 hours in a week. Uh, the traditional stock market, Wall Street, opens five days a week for six and a half hours. That's 33-ish hours uh, per week. That's a factor of five and a half, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you lend your money to some bot that's trading, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, what was it? Uh, Netflix and uh, uh, a AMC shares. Yeah. Uh, you know, Game, GameStop or something. Money. Yeah, GameStop. It can only make money for 33 hours a week, right? It has a 33-hour workday. You put your money in Uniswap or some sort of AMM, 
it works for you 168 hours a week. Yeah. That's a lot of it's you pretty know, powerful. operational improvement, correct? Yeah. And so, you know, especially whether it's Ave or these Uniswaps, wherever it might be, um, you know, uh, and I, I used to joke when Unis, Uniswap has just these simple 50-50 pairs in, in Uni V2, uh, because it sells two assets, I used to call them lemonade stands. It has like sugar and water and it creates this product of lemonade, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's going to be a little more sour. It's like uh, the impermanent loss like shifts the balance of how much lemonade and how, how, how sweet or how sour your lemonade is, but it's always still lemonade, uh, that that's kind of the thing where you can either invest in a lemonade stand that some, you know, hardworking entrepreneur in the traditional world does something offline, or you could invest in a 24 seven lemonade stand. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's the kind of, uh, innovation from a technological and, uh, business application perspective that DeFi offers that so many of these things, uh, are business models that no one could ever think of, right? You can't sustainably run a bank uh, by giving out more yield to your investors than to the people that you're borrowing uh, mm -hmm. money to, right? Uh, let, uh, lending it back out, right? Uh, and you cannot uh, run a, a lemonade stand 24-7, uh, you know, a handmade, right? Uh, that's something where uh, the, all of these different DeFi protocols have done what we didn't think was really possible per se, mm -hmm. uh, via a lot of its, you know, decentralized, open, transparent and, uh, uh, you know, uh, totally plugged in yeah. uh, that anyone can go and participate in these ecosystems. They can verify the trust well, of these things. Let, let's talk about that. I mean, you, so we're, we're, we're mixing a couple of metaphors here. There's, yep. there's a lemonade stand, there's the, the ice cream truck. <clears throat> Tell us about impossible and how <clears throat> impossible kind of uh, curates projects and like, how do you guys go about selecting which projects you guys want to support? Yeah. So I think this is a really important question and we're really lucky in that we obviously have a little bit of network that we've been able to cultivate over our few years uh, in the crypto space so far. And I think a lot of the best builders we saw, you know, kind of graduated out of projects, you know, Pete yourself, you know, uh, spent some time at other projects before and then went on to join newer teams as they were kind of coming up. Right. And I think that talent is always a signal of what's kind of happening in the space. Right. You always have, you know, uh, the apple far, not too fall, fall, not too far from the tree. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, we were actually able to cultivate some of this uh, at Binance as well that one of the most recent uh, kind of launch pads that we did was Alpha Hamora uh, or Alpha Finance. Um, Great and project. That, and that they, uh, the, the core development team and some of the other folks on the ops were actually developers at Band Protocol, uh, which was an Oracle uh, project that we launched not too shortly after uh, 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 Harmony uh, in mm -hmm. the order of our Binance launch pads. And so you can see time and time again that some of the folks that were the core drivers of, of awesome uh, you know, ex, ex, uh, execution at our previous uh, deals kind of compounded into further deals uh, mm -hmm. uh, down the line, right? Um, you know, I think Pete, when we first talked, uh, you actually went through a few different teams that uh, you were doing some interesting stuff with, uh, all within uh, the kind of general thesis of building more scalable blockchains and giving people opportunities to build uh, interesting tools in these very performant blockchains. And, and I think that that's the thing where we can very quickly identify some of the theses or themes that individuals have mm -hmm. kind of tapped into in their careers. Uh, I think I'm no exception to this type of uh, uh, kind of my, my inner stripes, if you will. Uh, before Binance, I actually uh, spent uh, a good amount of time while I was in college at Republic, which eventually spun out CoinList. So obviously mm -hmm. a lot of folks... Uh, are familiar with CoinList and a lot of the kind of due diligence uh, kind of uh, uh, background that a lot of these centralized uh, launching platforms have have offered. And how I kind of got into that uh, uh, world was that I was really focused in microfinance and, and charitable uh, kind of uh, impact investing uh, pieces of, of the greater kind of finance puzzle. And that at that point in time, a lot of the things in the Angelist and Republic family were doing a lot of very interesting impact oriented uh, kind of uh, strategic investments for retail users. And so I broke, I think, the, the Angelist API by manually clicking and just reading about <laughs> 
because I was just so interested in trying to learn more about everything in this fintech space. Yeah. And I think that kind of maniacal, uh, maybe ADHD, if you will, to just, you know, mm-hmm. feel like I'm just going to go ignore everything uh, and just try and, you know, not really focus on one thing, but just try to grasp everything around me at the same time is exactly what kind of let me do the same thing for a lot of crypto and DeFi. And as the new projects kind of came to pop up, that's a lot of how our team just feels like we have incredible surveillance across the entire space, Mm -hmm. uh, both from a a digital and a, 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 sorry, a data driven, as well as a uh, kind of just network driven uh, approach that we can find uh, things that pop up to people before maybe the the retail masses have realized. So, you know, I think uh, we wrote a very long thesis a few weeks back on Axie Infinity. And obviously that's been the the talk of a lot of folks in in the crypto world. Amazing Uh, project. uh, You'll see that, you know, maybe in in May or or early June, uh, one of my first tweets was, hey, look, uh, Axie Infinity uh, today has collected more in fees on its marketplace than Bitcoin has in a month. Mm-hmm. Does that matter to anyone? And I think the engagement on that tweet was like, I don't know, four, four, four likes and, and no <laughs> comments, right? No one wants to talk about it. It's a game. And I, and I put, I think uh, I tagged token terminal the next time uh, so that then there was a nice graph next mm-hmm. to my data and then they retweeted. And I think it was only their followers that retweeted No one wanted to talk about, you know, NFT stuff. And now you see like two months later, everyone's talking about it. And that's yeah. the type of thesis finding that, you know, we really want to double down on at Impossible and then work with every single possible project across any type of space. We just want to be open-minded and mm-hmm. be willing to take on a lot of these different opportunities and go after what we think you know, maybe the space has not realized was important. And you can see this in, in the strategy that we did at Binance Launchpad as well. Um, you know, in 2019, gas fees were not that high uh, mm-hmm. on Ethereum and there were no, you know, large DeFi dApps like today. And a lot of the early bets that, uh, you know, you know, Binance made were teams like uh, Matic, now Polygon, Seller, Harmony, so on and so forth all EVM compatible chains that, you know, for better or for us, I think obviously some teams have, have captured more audience than others, but we were really betting on a thesis that we said, Hey, EVM matters that these people will want, you know, scalable, uh, you know, platforms where they can do this type of stuff. And, you know, maybe we're a little bit too early, you know, maybe it wasn't the smartest time to sell tokens three years ago for some of these blockchains but that we felt really good about the long-term perspectives of being mm-hmm. able to build these types of ecosystems before other people were, right? That's the same reason why Axie was a deal that we were able to do in 2019, when maybe most people are questioning, why are we launching a game on yeah. a financial platform, right? <clears throat> so that's so kind of the general thesis that, that we have. We were betting on everything. And then we want to let the community help filter uh, things further, but we want to raise attention for some of the trends and kind of notices that we've we've kind of captured as mm-hmm. we surveil the space. No, it sounds like the way you curate projects is you have this long history of relationships with lots of folks in, in the blockchain space and the experience that you gained at Binance in evaluating projects, project teams, and, and really learning how to to see kind of like the subtle signals of alpha. And you're bringing that to to bear now at Impossible and helping uh, Impossible kind of curate which teams that you guys want to to support on the launch pad. Um, Now, some of these teams are going to be building on multiple chains. And how how does that work with with Impossible? Yeah, so this is actually a core part of it where... If we're going to be the ice cream truck that goes to all these different places, we also have the recipe of how to be an ice cream truck. And we think that a lot more teams should be ice cream trucks because their protocol or their their user base uh, probably doesn't reside in just one pocket of, of users in the greater kind of decentralized world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, I think you and I have both joked about different ghost towns that maybe have a lot of uh, a hype, but maybe less users. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll call one out actually right away for some juicy uh, kind of data-driven uh, uh, approach. So and not an ad hominem, just the, the facts, right? Um, that if you go into the Chrome web store and you go take a look and you search how many downloads does MetaMask have, it has, I believe, about 6 million 
uh, downloads, right? Uh, Binance Smart Chain Wallet, which it doesn't necessarily uh, imply all of the Binance Chain users because Binance, Chain, Binance Smart Chain can be interactive with using MetaMask. Uh, Binance Smart Chain alone already has something like 1 million uh, downloads or so. Very interestingly, number three in the rank of Chrome uh, Wallet uh, downloads is actually Axie Infinity's Ronin uh, Wallet. Not any of the other things and other blockchains that you see in the top, you know, 20 or 30 market cap. It is actually this little game that nobody wanted to pay attention to a while back. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you compare that to maybe something like Polkadot. Um, The scale of even Polkadot is like a few hundred thousand uh, downloads compared to things that are much closer to the million mark. And you, you saw how much hype and excitement that some of these other blockchains had. And unfortunately that's already pretty good. That's still mm-hmm. ranked probably in the top, you know, 15 or, or, or 20. So, uh, you know, blockchain applications out there. And I think that that's something where uh, the scale at which crypto is today is still really small, right? And that's also the encouraging sign for a lot of folks as they're kind of considering uh, paths coming into crypto uh, from traditional worlds that, you know, when some of the leading protocols in, in crypto have just tens of thousands of users, it means that we haven't had a winner take all situation yet. Yeah. We still have a very, very wide open uh, kind of ecosystem for folks to to use, to try and to to fail, you know? And I think that's something that really excites me as we get to work with so many different project teams and builders that, you know, our, a lot of our, the rest of our team is actually also from centralized exchanges. We saw a lot of the kind of development from a more macro perspective in, in the crypto world and just tried to pick out a lot of the micro learnings that we, we gathered from each of the project teams that we worked alongside and that this is kind of our chance to hopefully take together some of these different uh, macro and micro uh, learnings that we've seen to hopefully be able to build you know something really impactful with impossible as a, a decentralized incubator launchpad and swap so obviously for the more kind of traditional finance folks you know you obviously have a lot of primary uh, markets where a lot of people do these types of seed stage deals invest in early stage tech uh, and then also you have secondary liquid markets that traditionally need you know a lot of financial vetting before you get through an IPO and and, uh, and all that jazz to finally get some ticker symbols so that kids can go trade it on Robinhood, right? right. You know that that's always something that uh, has been a very kind of separate uh, world that wasn't really open per se to to folks, right? You know, I think even the kids that are trading on Robinhood uh, or the quote unquote TikTok investors, they actually can't open accounts themselves. They need their parents to open it and then they go do whatever they want. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, I think is very antithetical to uh, what crypto is, right? Uh, the, the crypto is very much like, I don't know if you're, a, uh, you know, some random kid somewhere or you're, uh, you know, actually a CTO of a traditional listed stock exchange company, uh, and you just happen to be passionate about the space, uh, that everyone is able to be on a level playing field to participate. Um, and that being able to be a part of something like this is in theory, a much larger ecosystem or community than what any centralized investment opportunity <clears throat> or, you know, traditional Silicon Valley investor, uh, you know, uh, can present. And I think that's, um, you know, great segue for why impossible. Uh, we raised uh, and we, we create a lot of headache for ourselves operationally because we we raised uh, f- uh, about $7 million from, from over 120 some uh, funds and, and builders in the space. But we we always really like the idea of it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, maybe it takes a, a hundred twenty uh, person village to raise a, a, a DeFi launchpad. Uh, <laughs> it, it's something really important for us to try and have as many different voices, supporters, and perspectives because it's also the best way to stay balanced and and even keeled as we look at this entire space. Yeah. Because we'll hear you know information directly from the ground or the data from each of these different teams because maybe you know you're looking at competitor analysis of other layer one blockchains and we say oh wow that's actually really interesting we didn't know that right and then having this type of sponge that has 120 water sources next to it means that we're always going to soak up the most information from everyone around us i think that's a great strategy really core part of what we want to tap into for this entire 
kind of uh, uh, opportunity within this blockchain space. And mm-hmm. so even though obviously it, was, it wasn't the most fun sending so many SAFs and dealing with so much you know, uh, regulatory, uh, you know, uh, considerations. Um, but that that's definitely something that we're really, uh, happy to be able to enjoy the benefits of, uh, in the long run. Yeah. Well, you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, you know, many chains would really benefit from a decentralized incubator, a decentralized launch pad and a swap. And that, that feature stack, um, just makes a ton of sense because, you know, we're hoping in this hackathon that we're going to see some really great and interesting projects. You know, one of our goals is to make sure that these teams are are composed of folks from traditional finance and also Web3 and that, that they teach each other and learn from each other and hopefully solve some amazing problems together. There's a lot of folks in Web3 that don't have backgrounds in finance. Yep. And there's folks in finance that and, uh, you have people like me with no background. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so, but what if we put them together in this yes. hackathon? And so we're hoping to see lots of really great submissions and it would be amazing if these submissions were, were, you know, had some kind of uh, venue in which they could be incubated and then they could raise um, uh, some capital uh, so that they can continue towards, you know, user acquisition and growth. And so I think uh, uh, Impossible Finance is doing some amazing things and is, I think, definitely filling a need that's in the marketplace. And so kudos to you and the team for that. Now, tell us right now, you guys are in the middle of an IDO. Uh, for, so before we wrap up, tell us more about what an IDO is and then uh, tell us about how people can get involved. Sure. Uh, I, I feel like I've, I've done this explainer a few times. It's actually our team ourselves is, ha- is has this uh, composition that you just said. We have some folks that have more traditional finance background and maybe less DeFi experience. And you have some folks who just patrol Twitter and, and, and Discord all day, you know, grabbing all the DGEN data out there, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's been a, an amazing composition to be able to have ourselves. And I think that's a definitely a winning recipe to, to create stuff within this hackathon as well. Awesome. Um, in particular, uh, an IDO is an is initial decentralized uh, offering. So you can think of it a lot like a IPO, except that it's not on Wall Street, it's on your MetaMask or on your, you know, uh, your own device, right? And I think that's something that that is really, really interesting because, uh, you know, back in the day, maybe you've heard of the term ICO, initial coin offering. There are a lot of folks that were just simply selling tokens and putting up, you know, websites and just creating something where it's just like why you might not want to uh, purchase something from, a uh, small street market. While mm-hmm. I think I love a lot of great street food, uh, I also often get a tummy ache, tummy ache from uh, some of the, these things, even if it tastes great, just because we don't know if those stores are going to be around tomorrow, right? And that's kind of the status of what crypto was in a lot of 2017 and 2018. And maybe some of the kind of criticism that a lot of folks had with, you know, how crypto had very little guardrails to protect users, yeah. that the IDOs uh, and a lot of these different uh, kind of protocols that kind of came in to fill this space, they actually touched on two very interesting uh, kind of issues. One was that they created a lot more automated tools that let programmers and builders launch things directly to the public. Uh, in a type of direct consumer type of format, right? People like Andre Cronje and other folks were able to just simply ship some code. And then, you know, within minutes, there were millions of dollars using their technology to be able to do cool stuff in the DeFi world, right? And that's something that simply put could not happen in a regulated, uh, you know, very structured uh, environment. Mm-hmm. And that's something that within the, the DeFi world uh, has been able to allow and attract a lot more high quality builders and technical talent to finally join this crypto ecosystem. Right. Whereas maybe it was the people that like me, you know, I, I didn't get into uh, places like Google uh, where I know Harmony has a lot of ex Googlers. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't even get an interview, right? I'm, I'm a reject uh, from the <laughs> pile of, uh, or, or echelon at which now a lot of these projects have, have some incredible talent from, right? Um, but the, that was the, the the structure of a lot of the early projects. It was from a lot of folks that maybe didn't get 
you know, the opportunity to be able to be a part of some of these fast moving uh, high tech or high, you know, uh, finance kind of ecosystems. And that uh, they kind of had the lowest opportunity cost to join a nascent space like crypto. Right. Yeah. And that as we've seen uh, a lot of these different tools increase that, you know, you have mathematicians and physicists looking at Uniswap and uh, automated market makers and how to create, uh, you know, more efficient algorithms because right. it is really appealing question for academics and researchers. And it's, and, and, it's and an amazing content. research space. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now tell us about, um, so you're in the middle of your IDEO. Yep. What, how can people learn more about it, participate if they wish? Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, all of our information can be found on our website at impossible.finance. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, social media pages like uh, Medium, uh, Twitter, Discord, Telegram, so on and so forth. So more information on, on any part of uh, our kind of process uh, can be found there. Uh, if you guys ever have any questions, you guys can also feel free to message me uh, or any of the folks uh, within the official Telegram channels. Uh, so feel free to, to kind of ping more. But overall, awesome. uh, you know, for these different IDOs, the main goal is to have some sort of entity uh, or platform that systematically helps vet these deals uh, to be able to offer out to the public, just mm -hmm. like something like a NASDAQ would go and check whether or not this project is legitimate uh, to be allowed for users to trade it uh, in a traditional world, that we are essentially stamping our approval and our research to back some of the projects out there in the space so Got that it. it is fit for retail. I think uh, it's like a, a personal uh, 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 taste test. Like back in the old day, like uh, kingdoms, you had the guy that tastes like food for poison uh, before <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. our king is the retail. It's you, right? And whether it's someone that has lots of crypto experience or someone that's brand new, we do want to be that kind of guide or that uh, beacon that helps find some of these, you know, top tier projects in the space. Awesome. Well, Calvin, thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us to tell us about yourself, about Impossible Finance. Um, for those in the audience that are interested, go to impossible.finance to learn more. And uh, as, as projects in this hackathon, um, if they get to the point where they want to productize and, and grow their project, um, how, how can they best get in touch with, with, uh, with you? Yeah. Uh, Twitter is definitely the, the best place. Like I, I'm very bullish on building in the open. Okay. Uh, unfortunately at a lot of platforms or companies, right. You, you can't share all of your customer secrets, right. Sure. Uh, or, or any of your company secrets. Right. And I think it's something really powerful when you're building at a hackathon or other stuff, it kind of lets a lot of folks guards down that normally wouldn't be willing to share so much, but you get to see what's going on, right? I remember Pete used to just go and ask people, hey, you know, what are you building, right? And then people are like, oh, I want to pitch you my, my idea, right? That this type of free flow of ideas is going to be the best uh, way to hone what you want to build is some guy, whether it's a Twitter troll or someone that's really constructive, they're going to give you feedback regardless. And it's up to you whether or not you want to, you know, absorb that or, you know, ignore that. And I think that if you hoard the idea and just say, oh, I'm, I'm building this cool thing, but it's in stealth, that is the worst thing that you can do because you only get your own mind to think about the problems that exist there. Mm -hmm. I think the, the uh, shoot, I forgot the name of, I think it's Cunningham's Law, but uh, it will prove itself if I get it wrong, is that the thesis of this theorem is that if you post something, the fastest way to get an answer uh, to a question is to post the wrong answer on social media. And I think it's 100% <laughs> correct that whatever you do, people will argue, people will fight about it, but that's the value. That's like, that's the value of an advisory board for a startup, right? Yeah. People will never always agree with you, but they'll give you feedback that they genuinely believe. And what better to get feedback from, from people that have zero stake in the game to care about whether or not you succeed or, or fail, they give you the honest answer of what you're building. Right. Awesome. And that's something that I, I really subscribe to. I'm very, very, you know, open, I think on, on Twitter, like you, if you at me, I will try to find what's going on, you know, awesome. and so a lot of folks have shared uh, interesting stuff. Like, you know, how I got into Binance was I, I shared my GitHub myself to, to Binance during the interview process. And I remember my boss, you know, uh, in the first week, he told me, yeah, you were the only applicant that shared a GitHub. Like it, it was simple as that as to why I stood out in, you know, maybe a bunch of 
uh, much more qualified folks. Uh, mm-hmm. That there was one thing that that I shared that was an open link that uh, it happened to include my research thesis at UChicago on uh, crypto exchanges, and so it gave him something to click uh, when he was looking at my resume. Uh, and then he said, "Oh, this guy's been thinking about exchanges for a year, right?" That's awesome. And that's something where you know, you, as a builder or as a creator in this space, all you need to do is give people a wormhole to go down. If you provide that wormhole, people will go down that wormhole. And so I'm no exception to that. If you drop a pitch deck or share questions, just simply ask stuff uh, okay. on Twitter. And I think that's how a lot of the DeFi world has kind of built and how open it is. You know, I think last week I asked uh, SBF uh, from FTX, uh, Sam Bankman Freed, uh, I asked him what his preferred uh, alternative uh, to meat was uh, beyond meat or impossible uh, meat. And he answered, right? And so I think that's kind of the openness of this entire space that people just genuinely are curious individuals and being able to build an open lets a lot of curious people grasp onto what you're building and hopefully give you even more feedback at, you know, hopefully creating something really powerful. Awesome. Well, with that, uh, we are uh, excited to learn more about Impossible Finance as developers, you know, get to the point where they want to productize and, and possibly raise some capital. You know, we'll definitely funnel them to you and Impossible.finance. Yep. So, can't, can't wait to hopefully be, uh, you know, the go-to place for folks to launch, uh, you know, projects, especially if they're, you know, building the Harmony ecosystem. We're perfect. very excited to hopefully see as many great things come out of this hackathon. And we're really excited to hopefully uh, be a part of the growth of the Harmony ecosystem. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Calvin. And uh, and to the audience, uh, you know, ping us for any questions. Um, we can definitely put you in touch with Calvin. Thank you.